No. Um, put your hand up in the room if you consider yourself maybe as a geek or a programmer, a developer, a nerd. Okay? Uh, roughly most of the room. Okay? Now, if I mentioned something like a BBC B, a ZX81, Commodore 64, anybody here who kind of feels that they're kind of here, in a way, because they had an experience with that at some point in the history? Wow, a lot of people in the room. And so uh, we have a lot in common now, because all those things that you've said, I, I share with you, except my education started in Ireland. I, I, I grew up in Ireland, lived in a field somewhere, and then my family decided to move to England, <laughs> where they had schools, big schools, and swimming pools, and cinemas, and wow, it was fantastic. And they also had computers. And they probably had them in Ireland, they just didn't have them in fields, because there was nowhere to plug them in. <laughs> so, um, so I spent about 30 years ago, I'm, I'm 40 this year, um, about 30 years ago, I went in one lunchtime, sorry, I'd done my maths lesson, and the bell went, and I said to the teacher, what, what are all these things? And she said, oh, they're computers, BBC micro bees. Uh, I said, how do you use them? She said, well, come along at lunchtimes. And I said, what do we do? She said, just do whatever you want to do. So I came in and I did uh, Alan is ace, 10, print, you know, repeat, go to, oh, oh, yeah. Somebody else did Alan is gay. And I thought, right. So, <laughs> so uh, another time, you know, okay, let's not go there. But, uh, <laughs> and... Then I found out you could buy magazines from the news agents. You could get this magazine, brought it into school, BBC Micro Magazine, spend four lunch times typing a program in, Friday, run, error, error, this. I thought, huh? I followed everything. So you go through it, you check it all. It's exactly as it is in the magazine. So, right, well, oh, hang on, that's wrong. And what, it says DEF procedure, D-E-A-F. It should be D-E-F. So, as, you know, you start to realise, who's actually typed this listing? Is it the person who's created the program? Or is it somebody who's given it to somebody, and then somebody sat at a typewriter and... I, I don't know. But, uh, so you could wait a month later, and then you get in the magazine and would say, Sorry, readers, there was an error in last week's listing. <laughs> Buy next month's magazine, and you can find out how to fix it. Pfft, no, forget that. So you have to fix it yourself. And one of the really nice things about BBC, when you switched it on, the, the computer, it said, Ready. It's like, OK, master, tell me what to do. And it was uh, an 11-year-old. What an empowering experience to be... Somebody comes up to you, instead of telling you what to do, it was saying, give me your command and I will follow. And I thought, wow, what can we do? So I discovered it was a music command and it had channels and you could have loud and volume and tone and timbre and all those things. Then one day, it wouldn't work and I looked around the back and there was all these ports on the back, there were seven of them. And I thought, what's this RS-432, what does that do? <laughs> so I, there was no internet then, so I asked and nobody knew. Went in the magazine, in the great, you go to Dugate Smith's and they had every computer magazine and you could go in and you could look in and you could look at that one and, you could, and, and eventually I found something and you, you bought, I went to the electronics shop, bought a cable, bought these seven bin tin connectors, connected up together, one end of the room to the other, I could type Alan is ace on the other end of the room, it was saying Alan is ace, I thought wow, you know, and we could send messages from the other end of the room to the other, you know, didn't realise that somebody somewhere was already developing you know, the internet, and, you know, that, I might have felt a bit deflated, but I had, a, I had a network working in the room. Now, so I was 11 years old, and there was, I could go in and do this at lunch times, but there was nothing else, there was no computer, no level, there was no, there was no IT, there was no ICT, so uh, maybe I like electronics, I went to college, did A-levels in electronics, design technology, and I became a teacher, teaching systems and control, so we'd... Five, five, five timers and all this. So, anyway, so 30 years ago, if you, if you were around around about the same time as me, you'll know there was this huge initiative, the BBC Corporation, the government, uh, Acorn Computers, Sinclair tried to get in as well, but that didn't quite work out. And um, it had a massive impact, and I think it's left a lasting legacy that is, that is part of the reason why some of us are here, because we were op an opportunity was opened to us. Now, um, let's move on a little bit in time to... 1992, and that's, that's, that would be 20 years after what was called the Computers in School project, and um, Windows arrived, whoa, it looked really nice and new, and you didn't have to type commands in, you could move a mouse, and that was really novel, I remember Amstrad came in, they had their PC, and so everything was all GUI, graphic user interface, and you could do all this, and uh, we didn't need to learn how to program anymore, so we'd teach children how to use Windows, and that was the that was a thing, and we were teaching them how to use Lotus or Microsoft Office. And um, since then, you, you, you probably know, you probably read this, that universities 
they've seen a decline in numbers of graduates, people choosing to do degrees, masters, PhDs in related fields with computer science. Um, employers have been saying, where are all the programmers gone? That somebody's identified that there's, there's a, it's about every year there's about a shortage of about 10,000 programmers in the UK, and somebody else is trying to do something about that at the moment to fix it. Um, the universities start talking to the colleges. Why are you not sending us students anymore? Oh, well, our computer and A-level numbers have gone down. And there's just been a big drive for a maths curriculum. And those students, instead of going and doing computer studies at de a degree, they're going off and they're doing maths degrees or science degrees instead. And you probably know that Eric Schmidt was, uh, did this fantastic that speech. That every well, I say fantastic because everybody heard about it. It was written in the newspapers where he said, and you might have just heard, he says, Oh, and Mark has asked me to say, and he says, uh, you know, flabbergasted to discover that UK is a fantastic heritage in computing, and you've blown it away, because you're not doing anything about it. You're teaching children how to use PowerPoint in school. So that was, that's like the last 10 years, and now some people are shaking their heads and they're saying there's now this sort of overseas uh, outsourcing. Companies now that used to come to the UK to develop software, programs, all this sort of stuff. It's not my area of expertise, but I've read that they're now having to look at places like India, Poland, Romania, uh, and some parts of the US. And, Ca and Canada's got some sort of tax incentives that, that companies now are going to Canada and recruiting there because there's all sorts of benefits for companies to do that. So if you look, there's a, there's a trend. You can find this online. I've tweeted it at some point. Over the last four years, you can see that the UK, in terms of Income in software engineering coming to the UK, the UK was in the top five, it was in the top three at one point, it was in the top seven, and I think the latest one shows now, in terms of income coming into the UK, we've dropped out to top ten. Now, uh, they'd only report the ten, I don't know where the UK is now. So that's, that's like the last ten years. Now, about a year ago, um, I had my Damascus moment, and lots of things happened in this, in, in this 12 months, the last 12 months almost. One of them was, I had a parents' evening, where uh, some parents came to me with a year nine son, and I was telling some people this last night. And they said, um, I'll, I'll call him Jonathan. So, so the parents come to me and they say, we're really worried about Jonathan's progress in ICT. And I said, well, he's doing really well, he's got the top scores, he's got A's for this. And, and they said, that's not what we're worried about. Uh, has Jonathan told you what happened last year? I said, no, no tell me. Well, he earned £15,000 last year. Oof. And I said... Oh, uh, <laughs> to, now this family live on a farm just north of Preston. And I said, doing what? He, he writes code packs for games. I said, £15,000. They said, well, and he made £10,000 the year before. So he's doing, he's doing quite well, but we don't really feel he's getting a lot out of ICT lessons in school. He's going, no, I'm saying he's bored. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I, I mean, I'm trying to do something at the moment to, to help Jonathan to so that he at least gets the opportunities that he deserves. But maybe, I mean, I've heard people say that some people have got to where they are, they're successful programmers, in spite of their education, not because of it. And that's, that's a cruel and harsh reality. There was another experience as well last year. Um, we have this room in our school about this size, where if somebody's been bad or naughty, they've <laughs> kicked somebody or shouted something at a teacher, they, they spend like a day or two in this room, it, they get excluded, and it, it, but it's included in their... Ex anyway, two lads had to spend about two or three days in there last year because they're in year seven. Something seems to happen in year seven. Maybe you've, it's like you don't realise, you know, rea what reality is. Anyway, these two lads in, in year seven, they, um, they found a way to hack into our cashless dining system. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have these swipe cards in school. And it's a bit, it's kind of like McDonald's. We have this huge restaurant. You go in with your card. You go up to the dinner lady and, you sit, and she takes your card and a photo comes up of you and, it's, and it says your balance is two pounds and they say can I have a, one of those and one of those and, and then you go to another window and you collect if it's sandwiches or, or salads or potatoes or whatever, you go and collect them from different places. Well these lads, they figured out a way of hacking into the dining system, I won't tell you how, because <laughs> this might go on YouTube afterwards. <laughs> but these two lads who were 11 years old hacked into it that's fantastic. I wanted to put them on a pedestal and say, wow, you know. But um, that, that, that wouldn't be well received in the school, <laughs> for obvious reasons. But they got excluded for, for a few days because of this. 
How do they get found out? Because they decided to put £200 on as a daily allowance. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of shows um, a lot about the kids of today, that, that in many ways, compared to when we were their age, they're very advanced in terms of technology, but they haven't got the, such a savviness and the, you know, to, to be able to deal with the outside world. And that somebody would go, huh? £200? You know? And maybe if they hadn't made that mistake, maybe they'd still be having free dinners on somebody else's expense. Okay? Who says there's no such thing as a free lunch? <laughs> should turn them into gamekeepers. <laughs> You just, I'm going to give you a warning now. Next time you speak, I'm going to put on stage two, okay? They're bringing back horrible memories, okay? Now, if, no, no. I said questions at the end. I'm going to get to the exciting bits in a minute. That was the boring stuff, okay. Now, um, experiences. Now, uh, put your hands up if you've ever heard of Michael Gove. No, no, I didn't say put your hands up if you appreciate what he does. Put your hands up if you've heard of him. Okay, right, okay. So, at the moment... He, he pretty much decides a lot of what happens in, in schools, in, in the UK curriculum. And he's got all these plans, and, and, and I mean, if that's what he wants to do, that's fine. Just keep him away from me, because his plans <laughs> and my plans, we, we seem to overlap in places. He went to a grammar school up in Aberdeen, uh, where he learned ancient history and Latin and stuff like that. And he thinks that's fantastic, and he thinks that every child in the UK should be entitled to that. And there are people who agree with him. And he introduced this thing last year, it's kind of a... He called it a qualification, but it's not. It's, 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 it's called the English Baccalaureate. Some people call it the EVAC. And to get an EVAC, but you never actually get it, but to be classified as having received it, um, what you have to do is you have to get maths, a grade in maths, English, double science, and then some from the following categories. So it has to include either history or geography. I have no problems with that. You know, if you can find your way around and you know that other people have got there before you, that's very, very useful. <laughs> Um, sorry, that wasn't even funny, so don't justify it with a laugh. But there's another category, and from this other category, you have to have something that could include ancient history. Could be quite useful. Latin. Nobody's laughing, okay? That, that's true, okay? That's not a joke. Or biblical Hebrew. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room who think that biblical Hebrew, into the, you know... That's what we need to turn our economy around as a downturn. I mean, if we have a nation full of children that can speak biblical Hebrew, just look at the power that's going to do to our economy. Now, I, I happen to disagree with him on that, on that one point, especially. And, um, and now what's happened is, I'm hearing that schools are... They're saying, well, ICT isn't really great because kids can already do PowerPoint and all that. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll devalue ICT and we'll move it down and down and down. And I think this is now the opportunity where we need to say... Computing. We need to teach computing to children. I don't mean teach a 14-year-old how to be a programmer so they can go out and develop their own apps. If they want to do that, that's fine. But we need to, just like when you go to a supermarket and they say, would you like to try a sample of this cheese? Would you like to... At least let them know what it is to program. At least let them know what it means what, when we talk about hardware and software and these sorts of things. So they know there's a world out there beyond, beyond Microsoft. Um, so, now... Around about this time, there's a, there's, I'm not on my own, there's, there are, there's, a, there's a swelling group of teachers, okay? And... Have less for lunch, then. Right, you're on stage two now. It wasn't me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, now you're arguing with me. You're going to go to stage three if you are. Okay? <laughs> Stay behind at the end and we'll discuss it. Okay? Um, the, the BBC. So the BBC say, hey, Alan, you know, we see that you're trying to do this, you're trying to do that. We've, we've, there are some other teachers around the UK as well. Would you be interested in a pilot called BBC Code Lab? What we're thinking of doing, there's a lot of stuff happening at the moment. We're thinking of an idea where we provide every child in the UK with a computer. Okay? <laughs> Somebody's laughing. We provide every child in the UK with a computer, the resources, and, and that includes printed, a printed book, just like when you bought a BBC B, in the box was this big, thick, spiral-bound manual. You turned it through, and it had all the commands in there. There was examples of what you could do. Fantastic. That's how I learned how to program, from the BBC Basic manual. You can still buy it on eBay. There are people still saying, learn how to program you with BBC Basic. Um, anyway, so printed manuals, online resources, which include videos, forums, so you can put your code up there, you can share it with people, people can re-evaluate re-eval each other's code, say, hey, I love that, that's really, that's nice, clean code, you know, how did you do this? Or, oh, you could, just like we've done in one of the sessions before, we're, we're, and, and that's what developers do, they share, and, 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 and that sort of thing. And what was the last thing? Oh, and they're looking for a 
somebody who have, have a public profile, not me. It needs to be somebody who looks young. It could be male or female. I'm like Brian Cox, Steve Bakshel, uh, who well, you know you, you know these people. Johnny Ball did it with science, that, you know, and think of a number and all that sort of stuff. So the the plan is that from April 2012. There will be this massive public launch. If you Google BBC Code Lab now, you'll find almost nothing mentioned about it because we're, there's still negotiations going on. There's, it fits in beautifully with the BBC's charter, which is um, all about entertainment, education, and community. Now, if you're teaching children all over the UK how to program, and you give an example of that, it's not about providing the teachers with resources. It's about providing the children... It's all about empowerment and engagement, and they, they, are, they are the key things. So we've got entertainment, education, empowerment, and engagement. They're, okay, four, E4 or four E's <laughs> or whatever you call it. You'll have seen other initiatives like this in the past. It was WebWise, which was, which was launched about 15 years ago. And then about, about around about the same time, BBC Bite Size. And they're, they're, they're looking for massive impact. Now, some of the trials, some of the pilot work that we've done, um, has been, there's been national competitions. Okay? Now, when I'm talking about national competitions, I've just found something before. Google do a, a, an international competition called Coding. And um, they take entries from all over the world. The top, the ten countries, the, the, the highest amount of entries, um, where do you think the UK feature in the top ten? Somebody shout a number. Now, you, you don't have to put your hand up, shout a number out. Nine. Nine? <laughs> Try again. Very cold. It's a trick question. It wasn't in the top ten. It wasn't in the top ten. If you've been reading my tweets on Twitter, Techno Teacher, it was way out of the top ten. You probably guess. What was number one? India. Number, that was number... India was number one. Yes. 1.2 billion people in India. So they're going to have quite a large number of entries. Okay, 1.2 billion. Number two. What was number two? China. China. No. Nope. Russia. Russia. No. Nope. Poland. No. Nope. Korea. I've not heard it yet, no? USA. USA, okay, another huge country, 300 million residents, so there's going to be a, a fair amount of children there. Number three? China? No. Nope. No. Nope. Mentioned it already. No. Nope. Canada? No. Nope. Russia? No. Nope. Brazil? No. Nope. Romania? Begins with a B? Bulgaria. Bulgaria. How many people live in Bulgaria? 7 million. How many people live in India? 1.2 billion. How many people live in the UK? 66 million. Okay, a Bulgaria, a, a country with a population of around 10% of the UK, was in the top three in terms of... Now, how can Bulgaria get so many children? Because if you look, if you read, you find out about how they do it, it's all about competition. It's about getting children together. Don't have teachers who say, Oh, I'm, I'm frightened of programming. I never did a, a degree in computer science. It's about encouraging children, giving them opportunities. And we've got lots of lessons that we can learn from, from around the world. Um, Right, what else do I need to mention? Um, in the pilot, what we've had is... I mentioned the computer before. A very, very small computer. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at is, rather than... It's not meant to be for games. It's not meant to be for office applications. It can do all of these sorts of things. But one of the things we're looking at is where you basically you switch it on and you straight into some sort of a, a Python IDE. Now, it, whether that's idle... I was talking to Jeffrey yesterday about Larch. You know, there's some scope there for somebody now to step forward and say, well, I've got a fantastic way. Have anybody here seen Scratch? Have you ever heard of Scratch? Okay. Scratch has had a massive impact. It's come from MIT. Um, it's based on Logo in, in, in some way. Mitch Resnick, fantastic idea. Kids love Lego. Well, why not let them program using Lego? And that's how Scratch works. You have all these blocks. You don't have to worry about syntax errors. And, and it, that's had a huge impact on the UK. Now, I, I think I've got to the end of what my talk is all about. And I was going to, if you've got some questions for me, so can we stop recording now? Yeah. <laughs>